Welcome back to It's a Good Life. I'm so glad you're here. This is the first installment of a little series all about urban homesteading. I'm working with some friends over across the pond, actually, Victoria of Grow Your Groceries, Josh in the north with The City Stead, and my friend Kira over at Homestead Dreaming. Together, we're working on putting a playlist together of you know, our thoughts, what would we do differently? What's working well for us? What's not working so great? And what are our ultimate homestead dreams? Today's video is all about touring my homestead here in San Diego, California. And I'm gonna take you guys around and share with you guys what is working for us, what's not working for us. You know, what's the greater vision for this place? So come on, let's check it out. So if you've been at Hey It's a Good Life very long, you know that I have been working on this DIY reclaimed wood mobile greenhouse. And this for me has been a huge success so far. It has been a great place to harden off plants, to start plants, and it's a project I'm really, really proud of. I use all reclaimed wood and I love how it looks. And it's super functional and it's something that we can take with us when we move because something you may not know about us is that we are renters. And that means that everything you see here on this tour today is eventually gonna go with us to our next property. And so when I design anything for our homestead, I'm always keeping that in mind. I'm always thinking, okay, how can we make this easy for when our move eventually comes? And this is one of those things that is going to be so easy to take with us because we can just roll it on the truck and take it with us wherever we end up. So let's take a look inside and I'll show you guys what I'm growing. So I won't take you through everything I'm growing out here right now, but there are a couple things I'm really excited about. Back here, I've got sunflowers that I saved from last year's Mongolian sunflowers. Really excited about that. In front of that, we've got lots of tomatoes. Super excited about our tomatoes. And right here, I've got Moringa. Moringa is a superfood, and I've been dying to grow it. I've had a really hard time germinating it, but it's germinating, so I'm stoked about that. Back there, we've got some catnip. Over here, we've got some squash. Um, a lot of these plants are going to be things that we transplant into our own garden, but they're also going to be plants that we sell. This is part of how we make money on the homestead is selling plants. So I'm really excited to have this space to grow and start and harden off plants. And I really enjoy having it on wheels because it allows me to capture the best sun or avoid the sun if I need to throughout the day. This is definitely a project that has worked out well for us and I'm really happy with it. All right, welcome to the garden. This garden is something that we envisioned the moment that we set foot onto this property. To save money, I built this garden with my own two hands using cedar fence pickets. And there are some things that I really love about this garden and there are some things that I might actually change about this garden. The beauty of using cedar fence pickets is that it's inexpensive, which is great, but they must be used properly. Now here, I've got a little bit of error here in my build. It's kind of split, it's warping a little bit, and I don't know if this is just, you know, my lack of expertise or skill, or if this is just the fact that I'm using inexpensive wood. Ideally, one day I would love to use like nice, beautiful, thick redwood panels, but you know, we did this on a budget. This entire thousand square foot garden cost us about $1,500 in total, like with soil. So overall, very cost effective. Will it stand the test of time? only time will tell. And hopefully we won't be here that much longer to know if it's gonna fall apart or not. Um, one thing I did do is I went ahead and sealed all of these panels. And if you wanna see the whole video on how I built this or grab the garden plans, just click the link up above. You can watch the video. I'll include a link to the garden plans down below. So in this bed, we're growing what I call our salsa garden. We've got peppers and tomatoes and herbs show them the herbs that are looking really bad right now. <laughs> it's hot here in California. Oh, thank you for coming to my defense. Over here, we've got our cucumbers and melons and I have practiced square foot gardening for quite some time now. It's a great beginner method. I've only been gardening two, maybe three years. So I still have a lot to learn. I really like the square foot gardening method. However, it is not for every plant. It is not for tomatoes and it might not be for melons. So. Could this be overspaced? Probably, but you know, we're living and learning. I try to tell myself progress, not perfection. So this is our cucumbers and melons, and over here we've got tomatoes. This is kind of our tomato forest right here. We've got two tomato forests on either side of the garden, and I am running a bit of an experiment. I decided to do one no-till tomato bed and one tilled tomato bed. So far, the results are not really 
they're inconclusive. Uh, but I am getting really excited for tomatoes. They smell really good. They're looking really good. My tomato! Okay, <laughs> so this is something we should talk about is the beauty of organic gardening is organic food for your family, but it means that you've got to be a little bit more diligent with the pests. We've got a bit of a sacrificial tomato. Now I'm just gonna leave this for the pest so that they can enjoy this and hopefully just touch this tomato and not eat all the other ones. Better hunting for those tomato hornworms. All right, and in our long 14 foot bed, I am trying to perennialize some kale. As you guys know, leafy greens do much better in the cooler winter months and here in California, I mean, that's only like two or three months out of the year. So uh, the kale back here is doing pretty well. It's turning into kale trees. And to harvest this kale, I do what's called the cut and come again method, which is just pruning off the bottom leaves and using these in our soups and stews and veggie stir fries and things like that. Back here, we've got squash and chard. And I've let my Merlot lettuce go to seed because I absolutely love this lettuce. Would love to hang on to this for many years to come. and help it adapt to the Southern California environment. So what tends to happen with lettuce when it goes to seed or bolts, those are all terms for basically a plant going to, to flower, to reproduce. And it starts to get really tall. The leaves turn really bitter. That's to the plant's favor, right? It doesn't want you eating it anymore. It needs to produce babies. So it turns rather bitter and it puts off these fuzzy little flowers and inside each of these little fuzzies is a seed. And so to harvest these and save these, what I'll do is once all of these are all opened up, I'll take it inside, shake it about, and save all the seeds. Okay. We're good on camera. Oh, thank you. Do you want to... <laughs> You're so close to me. <laughs> Something I want to point out to you about my method uh, that really isn't working that well is growing tomatoes on canes. Now, I set out to try and grow tomatoes on a single vine and I knew that these canes would probably be too short and when the summer winds blew, well, so did my tomatoes. So if I could do things over, I would use tomato cages. And I know a lot of people have feelings about like bushy tomatoes or using tomato cages. Are they actually effective? Um, I'm using some right now and I'm actually for this garden preferring growing in cages. So. Eventually I'd like to, to do, I think what's called, um, eventually I'd like to do what's called the Florida weave method. And there's a couple other kinds of methods that I'd like to do, which involves basically stringing your tomatoes up really high. And here in Southern California, we can actually perennialize our tomatoes, which means we can have them all year long if taken care of properly. So we'll see how long these tomato plants last like this. I'm doing the best I can with the infrastructure I have, but again, I would do it differently going forward. Um, another idea I have that I'll probably implement in the salsa bed garden is to grow things up on hog panels. Um, having the beds as tall as they are, they're 40 inches high, means that I don't want to grow too much higher than that. And that's another consideration that, you know, if you're going to build really tall raised beds, that's something to consider is how how high do you want to grow? How 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 tall do you want your vertical gardening situation to be? For me, I don't want it to be really much more than eight feet. so. Anyway, these are all things to consider that if I could do it differently, I definitely would use tomato cages and not canes. I would love to eventually do some kind of trellis method using rope, like the Florida weave method or something like that. But for now, this is good enough and we'll see what kind of a harvest we get. All right, something else I wanna mention to you, it's kind of hard to see, but I'll show you that around my garden, I have chicken wire. Now, you might be going, well, why did you hang chicken wire? Well, it helps me string up our fava beans which honestly need a little bit more sunshine. We need to cut the tree back and make some adjustments, but it allows things to grow vertically using the infrastructure that I have. So let me talk to you a little bit more about that. All right, so around the entire garden, I've basically placed chicken wire for the purpose of vertical gardening. Now, I don't have land or ways or abilities to do T posts and cattle panels for vertical gardening. So I'm using the infrastructure that we have by gently placing some chicken wire on the existing fence and eventually this will serve to trellis things like cucumbers and melons and lots of little things that we've got started over here in our Google culture garden, which I'll show you in just a minute. But first, I wanna show you something that I'm really passionate about, which is pollinators. This is our pollinator garden. And in our pollinator garden, we have all sorts of flowers. 
A favorite amongst the pollinators is our salvia. We have a couple different kinds. These tend to do really well in uh, climates like ours. And so I'm learning more about growing things that do well in your native climate. In this pollinator garden, I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way, which is grow things that do well in your climate. I have planted things that are very heat tolerant, like yarrow, like sweet alyssum, like rosemary, like lavender, all of these things, and salvia especially. Salvia does really well in the beating Southern California sun. Uh, these are all things that do really well in this climate, and I've learned my lesson the hard way through many plants dying, that it's better to plant things that do well in your zone rather than try and force something to grow that doesn't really grow there naturally. Another benefit to that is it saves us a lot of water. So water conservation, if that's something that you're into, it's something that matters to me, is um, by planting local plants. That's right, that's the right word. Native. By planting native plants, you can definitely cut down on your water use as well. So it's our pollinator garden and the birds and the bees and the butterflies really like it. <laughs> There's actually something else that I didn't plan to talk about in this video, but when we first moved here, we didn't have a washer or a dryer. And so I decided that, okay, fine, I would wash our clothes at a laundromat, but I wasn't gonna pay to dry them. So I actually have a video on how to hang a clothesline between two trees, if that's something you're interested in. And it actually moves and it's got little clips on it and stuff. It did the job while we needed it. Uh, but yeah, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> All right, welcome to our work in progress. You guys are very much behind the scenes with us right now. So this area is a bit of a mess at the moment as we're in the process of transforming it. But we recently showed you guys how to build these beds. They're super rent friendly, really great if you're growing on concrete like us, and they fit five gallon buckets really, really well. The plan here is a hookah culture garden in containers. So I'm really excited about this because I've been really wanting to experiment with Google, cult Google culture. Um, and I thought eventually, I thought originally I was going to grow tomatoes here and do the Florida weave method like we talked about earlier, but I think I'm gonna grow other things, maybe like squash, melons, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I haven't totally planned it out yet, but um, we've got the buckets into position. We're in the process of cutting the wood and filling the bucket. So hopefully very soon I'll have a Hoogle culture in container gardening video for you guys. Something I am really excited about, container bags. Uh, what are these called? Gardening bags, I think is what they're called. Uh, this is one plant in particular that I'm really excited about. It's supposed to be like a 200 to 500 pound pumpkin. I think it's called the King Squash Pumpkin from Baker Creek. And it is loving these grow bags. Um, in fact, all of the plants that are in grow bags right now are doing really well. I'm using Fox Farm soils and yeah, these grow bags and the plants are absolutely loving it. It's another example that's doing really well. This is birdhouse gourd and I think it's edible, but I'm actually growing it so that I can have birdhouses. Uh, but this is something that would be a great wall covering on that chicken wire like we showed you earlier. Uh, so I'm really excited to pot this up and get it growing on some trellises and have this lush green feeling of being surrounded by greenery. So, oh, welcome to my worm bin situation. Oh, actually it's pretty dirty. So these are some of our worm bins and as you guys might know already, I really believe in making as many of your own inputs on your homestead as possible. It's gonna decrease your cost. Homemade nutrients are so much better for your garden anyway. And so I have basically since day one of learning to garden, have been looking for like rent friendly, small space friendly ways to make our own inputs. And so one way we do that here is with the use of worms. <laughs> this is absolutely thrilling to my husband who's currently yawning behind the camera. <laughs> Yes, vermiculture, it's so exciting, I know. I'm a total nerd for worms, and if you guys wanna see the playlist that I'm working on right now for vermiculture and worm farming in small spaces, I'll leave a link right above. But here's some of the worm bins. They need to be amended, need to harvest some of the worm castings. But if you're looking for a way to make your own nutrients on site, low cost, low maintenance, super easy, I cannot recommend vermiculture enough. I really, really believe that worms are for everybody. I'll hop off my soapbox now and take you to the front. Get lower, make it look good. Oh, you're back here, that's fine. Hello and welcome to the front garden. So this is something that is not going so well for me right now. Remember how I was talking about the importance of 
using plants that are native to the area and all of that. Well, this is why. This, this, is, this, this bed is struggling. And what I aim to do instead is to replace this bed with corn. I think the corn is gonna be a great window covering and corn likes to be really close and nestled together. So I think it's gonna be really inviting to have corn growing in the front anyway. So this is gonna get all ripped out. It was an attempt at a pollinator garden, but it's not really working out and that's okay. So we're living and learning and adjusting. Um, and I just thought I would point that out to you guys that we're gonna rip this out. We're gonna do corn here instead. Corn does really well in blocks and rows like that. So we'll see how it goes and keep you guys posted. I'm a big believer of using any space you have to grow food. So I thought we were gonna do that in the front yard, but I have to confess, <laughs> it, it didn't really work out. First of all, I had some major issues with the leg choices that I used on this garden bed. I ended up having to take the legs off and in lowering it, it sent the message to the local neighborhood cats that this was now a litter box. Now my angel fur children have never gone potty in garden boxes, but the minute they smelt that other people had dealt it, well, it gave them some ideas. So a lot of you guys asked me questions of like, how do you get your beds, how do you get your cats not to use the beds as the restroom? And the answer is my cats have never done that. I'm really lucky like that, but neighborhood, neighborhood cats have, however. So instead of using this for food production, we're using it as an additional pollinator garden and some of the plants are doing really well. We've got Cosmos, got some zinnia that are starting to bloom. More of that sweet alyssum that does really well in our area. Over here we've got some strawberries in containers. Okay, so this lemon tree is something I'm really proud of. Did we plant it? No, but did we bring it back to life? Yes, and if you look very carefully, you will see lots of baby lemons. And this is where my shout out to worms comes in, is that I brought this tree back to life using aerated worm tea. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I will link a video right here up above. It is so jam-packed with bioavailable nutrients and lots of goodies. There are so many fruits on this tree now simply because I started using an organic homemade fertilizer. I cannot recommend it enough and we're super excited to have lots of lemons here real soon. Hello and welcome. <laughs> okay, you just let me know when you're- Hello and welcome to the front yard. This is where- <laughs> <laughs> Tommy's just trolling me today. This is where Tommy and I come out every morning, have coffee, let the cats outside, stretch their little legs, get their grass fixed, and really hang out. And I was walking past it thinking, wow, okay, yeah, we can keep going. We'll just talk about food production and that's what homesteading is all about, right? But I think homesteading is, is so much more than that. It's about creating a place that you want to be. And so it's really important to me to create like little nooks and crannies where it feels inviting. And so these are chairs that I salvaged for our wedding actually. And so they have the really sweet memory for us of, hey, these were at our wedding. And um, we've got another little eating nook right here that's nice and inviting and lush and green. Um, so these are all things and areas that kind of bring me joy. So I thought I would share them with you and just kind of highlight like not everything has to be about function. It can be about beauty as well. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that over here <laughs> on the ground here, it's kind of hard to see. I have a bunch of milkweed that I started from seed for the purpose of helping monarchs thrive on their journey north and south. And I'm learning a lot about what it means to be a monarch way station. Might even apply to be one here soon, but I absolutely love raising monarchs. The whole process is so fascinating to me and it's something that I really love and I hope to be able to pass on to our kids one day. And on that note, I gotta take you inside. So Tommy loves his whiskey and <laughs> One day he went to go enjoy some whiskey and get one of his little whiskey glasses out of our hutch when he noticed something very unusual inside. <laughs> and that very unusual thing was none other than a butterfly chrysalis. <laughs> <gasps> Happy birthday to our first little monarch of the season. Oh, she's happy, look. Outside is best.
So you can tell this is a girl because she doesn't have any scent glands on the backs of her wings. Hi, sweet thing. Isn't it just amazing though? These beautiful, sweet creatures. Pretty girl. Look at them. Hi. You're so pretty. She's just gathering up all her strength. Getting ready for her life in the wild, sticking her tongue out. Hi, pretty thing. There she goes. There she goes. That was so cool. So I was not expecting that when I was going inside. I was going to show you guys all of the caterpillar poop that she left behind while she was turning into a chrysalis. But just like that, she is ready to go and be released into the world. So pretty exciting stuff. Hopefully we'll be a, a monarch way station here really soon. It was really fun to share that with you guys. All right, and just like that, we're in the garage. Now, if you guys have been here a while, you know that we recently transformed our garage into bit of an urban farm. I want to give you guys a little bit of an update on that. So being small space growers, I really wanted to utilize every nook and cranny I could, which meant taking advantage of our unused garage space for seed starting. And over the last six months, this area right behind me has been my main area where I start seeds and keep seeds and store things. Um, but as the summer months have approached, and wanting to embrace outdoor growing as much as possible, I have transferred a lot of this seed starting production to the greenhouse. So you'll see some lights behind me and some heat mats behind me, but they're not currently in use because I'm learning how to use my greenhouse instead. But I cannot recommend this whole system enough. This worked really well for utilizing the 18 inches between the garage and the wall here. So if you're looking for a way to grow things in a small space, get yourself some garage selves, Get yourselves from some lights from Ace Hardware, some heat mats. So much can be done with just these few square feet of space and it was a really effective use of, of time and energy and space. So um, this was definitely a win, not currently in use, but I would definitely recommend 10 out of 10 to somebody who's trying to max out their small space to grow food. Something else I'm really passionate about that's not directly correlated with homesteading per se is recycling. So in place of the worm bins that were here, we now have our recycling center set up. Now it's a little tricky to get to where the worm bins are right now, just because we've got things in transition, but they're essentially on the other side of the wall of this garage. And the significant thing about that is that it's a north facing wall, which means it's going to be shaded most of the day, if not the entirety of the day, which is going to offer some thermal protection for those worms because we know we don't want them to get too hot or get too cold. And so in the summer months, that is a better spot for them than in the hot garage, which is why I've kind of changed this setup from the last time you guys saw it. And we're back to where the magic happens. And by that, I mean the kitchen, get your minds out of the gutter. <laughs> where does all of this homesteading land us? It lands us, it lands us back in the kitchen cooking real food. And that's what all of this gets down to for me. It gets down to love of real food and farm dreams. I really believe that one day we are supposed to have a farm based on a vision that I had many years ago. And I believe that stewarding the space that we're given along the way is part of how we're going to get there. And so learning with the space that we have to grow organic food, to preserve organic food, to build things, to fail, to learn, to get up, to try again is really, really important to me. And it's something I've really learned the value of. For example, I grew these potatoes myself. My most humble harvest to date, perhaps. I've got about five potatoes here, including some little potatoes that I don't even think qualify as potatoes, but hey, I learned something about growing potatoes. I've also got calendula, which I'm learning how to dry and turn into healing balms and salves. I also happen to have some gem corn that I saved here from uh, last year, which again is, is amazing. It's amazing to save seeds because it not only allows those seeds to adapt to your environment, but it's an amazing skill to learn about, you know, labeling things properly, but then also giving that story and handing that story down generation to generation. There's something really beautiful about saving seeds to me, and it's something it's an art form that I want to preserve and pass down to my children and future generations. But I call our homestead table if 
I'm looking for something, it's usually here, and so I'll yell to Tommy, it's on the homestead table! <laughs> I built this table with my own two hands. It's actually not quite done yet. When it is, I'll post a video about it. Um, would I build a table like this again? Not the way I built this one, because I know better now, but it works. It's standing, it's sturdy, it's almost all repurposed materials. These, um, these planks are actually repurposed from the first garden beds I ever built. So it's a really nice reminder to be working um, on food here and to remember like my very humble beginnings with many, many, many things that I learned in those first garden beds. So it's, it's, it's sentimental value if nothing else, but it also is very practical and a helpful thing to have around here. It stores things for us. Um, it's, a, it's a place to kind of hang our hat at the end of the day. We've got our little keys hanging up there. Um, it's become kind of like the, the central hub of the kitchen for me. And it's definitely a place I've really come to love and enjoy very much. All right, and I suppose we'll end where every day starts for me, which is right here at this espresso machine. If you guys know me, you know that I love craft coffee good coffee, coffee that's been roasted appropriately, that honors the process that took the farmer to grow that seed into something wonderful and aromatic and lovely. It just crushes my soul when I see so many beans roasted inappropriately, over roasted, oily. Um, I just, I love a good coffee. I love a coffee that honors the work that it took to grow it. I think that's important. And so I try to honor coffee here in my kitchen by making it well. I'm a firm believer that good coffee at home is possible. And for now, we have this little tiny machine. It is small, but it is mighty and it has done it has made us many a latte. I can't recommend it enough. I think it's actually in the products, in my like product section down below. So if you're interested in the mis this machine, I'd definitely say check it out. We really love this little Breville Barista Express is what I think it's called. All right, well, thanks for joining me today, you guys. It has been great to be with you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video of my urban homestead, what's worked well for us, what we would do differently. I hope it gives you a little bit of an idea of like, you really can max out the space to grow lots of food. Um, but it does take time. It's taken a lot of time to build this homestead to what it is today. And it's gonna be really hard to say goodbye to this place when that day comes. But I'm also really proud of everything I've learned here. And even if this just, even if this is just a stepping stone house, so much has happened here. And I'm really grateful for this home and everything it's offered to us, all the lessons learned, all the beauty grown. Um, it's been a good place to live. And yeah, it's taught me a lot. I think if I had to do everything differently, well, we'll save that for another video in the series, won't we? <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in today, you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and this video collaboration. Please be sure to check out all of my contributors, um, my comrades in this series. I will make sure that they're linked in this playlist. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next collaboration video next week. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.